Welcome back, everyone. Um, we're uh, eight minutes over the agreed upon time. I think it's a good time to start up. The so last people, last struggles will keep coming in. Um, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce our next speaker to you. Um, her name is Heather Kelly. She was named in 2013 as one of the five most powerful women in gaming by Inc. Magazine. Heather Kelly co-curated the groundbreaking 2012 exhibit Jeu Le Jeu, Play Along at La Gaieté Lyrique in Paris, France. She is a co-founder of Kokoromi, an experimental game collective with whom she has produced and curated the renowned Gamma event promoting experimental games as creative expression in a social context. Currently, she operates Perfect Plum, a consultancy for interaction sensory and game design. Heather's extensive career in the games industry has included design and production of AAA next-gen console games, interactive smart toys, handheld games, research games, and web communities for girls. <clears throat> Her award-winning 2010 design for the original Oh My Bod iPhone application used the iPhone touchscreen to control a connected Oh My Bod brand vibrator. Furthermore, as Moboid, Heather has created interactive projections using game engines such as Quake and Unreal. Her experimental art game work with Lynn Hughes, Fabulo Fabuleux, was created at Concordia's Hexagram Institute and integrates gameplay into a full body interactive installation using custom squishy interface hardware. Now, I, I personally would like to hear more about this. Yeah, I don't, you, you will talk about that, thank I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, the reason Heather's here uh, among all these other great um, achievements is especially because she has done some um, very innovative uh, groundbreaking work on you know human machine interface design whether in the context of art games or other installations so um, I will let her step on stage and tell you more about that in a second maybe uh, the last note I would like to bring up was I'm very happy to hear that as of January in the coming year uh, Heather Kelly has um, received a professorship at the Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon University. So I congratulate you to that, and I will um, just step aside and let you um, pick up the microphone. Right. Thanks, Mark, and thanks, Jan, for inviting me. And um, I've learned very quickly where the mute button is on my microphone because I'm overcoming the very tail end of a cold. So hopefully if I have to make a terrible sneeze or disgusting noise, I'll, I'll mute it first. So I'll hopefully spare you all. Um, so uh, yeah, oh, here we are, ready to go. Um, so what you see here is uh, perhaps uh, if you, uh, I'm based in Vienna right now, and uh, it's quite a typical Viennese cafe scene, and this was my, my working environment when I was, I was uh, writing this presentation, and it occurred to me um, that this is kind of the crux of maybe my frustration with, with most of, of game culture and why I've, I've uh, progressed along the career path I have. Um, and this is maybe, I know it's a little bit precious. I even learned a new uh, German word, geschmeckerlich, <laughs> um, for what this kind of image is. Um, uh, but I'm using it to make a point uh, that this cafe table scene hasn't really changed in a couple of hundred years, but it's still uh, immensely richer for the senses than most digital games are today. And why is that? How can we change it? Well, let's, let's have a look at that. Um, so for instance, on the table, there's a glass of wine. That's something that we associate with our sense of smell, of taste, even of, of feeling touch because of the mouth feel of the wine. Uh, and of course, the, the effect uh, on our senses of the alcohol. Um, there's a chocolate cake, uh, the taste of that, the, also the mouthfeel, the, the sugar, um, and the other chemicals in the chocolate that would affect our, our sense of pleasure. And even the sense of the heavy fork that you would use to lift that to your mouth. And then we also have the, the marble, very heavy, cold marble table and the nice uh, uh, thick writing paper that I have in my notebook and uh, so the temperature of everything, the weight of things, and, and especially I wanted to point out the, the quill pen, which is a kind of new thing I got to sort of help inspire me while I was writing. And when I was shopping, I, I was looking across the row of these quill pens and saw that the, at the very end of the row of like 300 models and varieties and colors and shapes, there were these ones that on the, on the very end of the, uh, the 
the hook say lefty, and I was like, oh, they made a pen for me, I'm a lefty. And, um, and uh, so I bought it, I, I actually, it was, a, I don't usually use a quill pen, so I didn't realize there would even be a difference between a righty and a lefty. Maybe I was suckered in once again by, by the lefty product conspiracy, but, but I like to think that there's actually a difference, and, and it was really actually important to me because I think it also pointed out one thing that, that I find both interesting and frustrating about interfaces is that not everyone has the same abilities, and a lot of times assumptions are made about what abilities people have. Uh, games are, are very uh, good at doing that, if you could say, and uh, I'd like to change that too. So um, for the most part, the, the digital game world in general has been pretty reluctant to engage, engage with all these very rich sensory modes. Um, but none, nonetheless, there are some creators who are working on the margins of games, myself included, and we've ventured to explore the, the wider human senses and what they can bring to digital interactive experience. So how do game creators shape uh, the work to cross this boundary between the guidance, the control that, that games are uh, offering, and to this embodied world and its sensory richness and, and chaos? And so what happens when we can feel and taste and smell our games? Yeah. So um, a little bit about art games or game art, as it, they might variously be called. Uh, I think right now is a really great time to answer the question of, of how uh, these games are going to, to be able to interact more with these other sensory modes. Um, these mixed digital physical games that I'll talk about are on the, on the forefront of creative game culture right now. They might be what are roughly categorized as independent or art games. And I'd like to show you some examples of unique embodied games that are pointing the way toward this diversity of practice and, and highlighting this, this kind of perturbed boundary between design and art and between the digital and the physical. And uh, they don't really fit very well into the, the mass-mediated product economy that you might think of when you think of what are games. You might think of something in your living room or on your computer screen that you download. These are, are not going to be like that. Uh, these games tend to be smaller, unique. Uh, some of them are just one-off. There's only one in existence. They require intimate situations. Uh, and they require often a very dedicated and invested uh, creator-player-advocate in order for them to exist in the world. There has to be sometimes be someone who, who is uh, helping the game to function and helping you to play it. So they're not consumable mass market products, but they're more a form of participatory culture. And these are four of the games that I'll, I'll chat a little bit about in this talk. Again with my water. So um, one thing that these games are is uh, the body is kind of a, a site of play for a lot of the, the new game uh, forms, new game culture. And this one here uh, is maybe familiar to more, than the, more people than the others. It's called Johann Sebastian Joust. Uh, it's from 2011, and, and when it arrived sort of on the scene, it made a, a huge impression because it's uh, very good at um, helping people cross that boundary from something that is digital to physical. Um, in this game, you can see that everyone is holding a, a kind of stick that has a ball on the end that's glowing uh, in a different color. That is a, a mass market product. It's from the, the PlayStation. It's, it's a, a PlayStation Move controller is what it's called. And in this game, every player uh, doesn't look at any kind of screen, but they use this game controller that would otherwise be used for a PlayStation game. And all they're doing is looking at each other and uh, moving around and trying to keep their controller very still and not jostle it while also trying to jostle and, and hit the controller or hit the other person, push them a little bit or put them off balance so that their controller wiggles and that uh, if that happens, then the, that, that player loses. So it's always this balance between keeping one of your hands quite still and kind of zen-like with the rest of your body is maybe making a dash to, to nudge someone else. So. Um, these games are, are very physical, both in the sense of, of extreme engagement with the human physical form, but also, of course, you know, Newtonian physics. Uh, 
uh, the body is this, a, a site of play for these games. And uh, so there's ga games that are having different sensors that you're attached to or that you're holding, and then the competing players that you're playing with must either attack or betray or elude, um, hide. There's many different strategies that people use to, to avoid, uh, to win, basically. You don't have to win by um, dominating. You can win by subtly avoiding, and no one notices you're there until, in the end, you're the only one who survived. So these games are a bit like a uh, sport, and uh, the body is both the obstruction to play and the site of contact for play, and they create very uh, spectator-friendly performances. As you can see there's, there's groups of people standing around waiting for their opportunity to play, but they're also watching and learning from each other and, and being um, entertained by the moment-to-moment the -moment drama. Um, similarly, another game uh, in this vein is, is Hit Me by Kaho Abe. Um, Kaho Abe is both a fashion designer and game developer, and I'll show you a few works of hers. Um, and in this particular one, you're wearing a helmet on your head, and your goal is to um, hit the button on the top of the other person's helmet. And uh, you can see where that would lead to some, some scrambling. Uh, and so it's, it's similarly physical to the other game, but it also brings in an element of, of uh, this photography. You can see the small picture there. Your, your, your helmet also has a camera in it, and you score extra points if you're able to actually get a good shot of the face of the person that you're hitting when you, when you get their button. So, so that, that's another way to, to improve your, your, uh, your score. But then on the opposite side of, of this very super uh, hyper physical type of, of game in this uh, bodies as a site of play uh, is another, here's an example. Um, this is Guru Meditation uh, by Ian Bogost from the same year in fact, but this is a game that he created uh, especially for the Atari VCS, so a console system that is decades old. Um, and he built it to go especially with a, a controller that you see here. It's the thing that kind of looks like a, a uh, I don't know, pedal of a, of a car, um, which is called, um, what is it? It's called the uh, Joy Board is, is the name of that. From 1982, Amiga developed this Joy Board. And, and uh, the kind of er version of the game can only be played with this, this system. Uh, he did do a later version that uses the iPhone and, and has a different bit of different, different dynamic. But in this version of the game, you need to sit on the Joy Board. And I'll describe to you. Uh, how the, how the play proceeds. The game is designed to be played by sitting cross-legged on the joy board. The player must situate themselves perfectly still on the device, legs crossed on the floor. The yogi will rise, slowly rise if the player is properly situated. <laughs> if the player moves, the yogi drops and the player can try again. Once enough time has passed, the yogi ben, begins floating and the timer starts. So essentially, this game is all about how still can you keep your body. I mean, you probably could get very good at, at a certain kind of meditation just by, by playing this game. And that's actually his intent, is that it has, in fact, a kind of real uh, value for, for learning stillness. Um, and, and at the same time, is this kind of uh, retro historical artifact. So another thing that these embodied games are good at is, is not only um, creating this kind of, of, of uh, physical play and movement, but also kind of designing it or shaping the, the quality of that movement. Um, uh, here, again, is another, another piece by Kaho Abe. It's called Ninja Shadow Warrior, and it's more of an arcade-type machine that uses a camera that's pointing at you and shows you a shape of an object that you need to conform on your own or with friends to, to the outline of that object to try to sort of fill the space of that object as if you're a ninja who has to hide behind you know, the vase in the hallway and you have to do something like this. So you're trying to fill it out as much as possible. And the camera uh, shows you back both the image that you're trying to fill and your success at how much of it you're filling. And then at the end, it's taking a picture, which is what you see here in the, on the bottom, where the, the couple have, have somehow managed to fill the, 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 the shape of the drum by holding one another upside down. And uh, it, it ends up, uh, because of the camera, you, you have a, a very good um, record of all the different ways that people have creatively solved the, the shape that they're trying to fill and, and uh, can, can view those. Um, and then the other piece is actually one that's going to be in the exhibition, or is, yeah, it, that's in the Amaze exhibition, I believe, um, called Raffle Pillar. 
And um, what you see is the, the two different views. One is, is from the outside looking at the players playing it, and the one on the bottom right is if you are a player and you're on the inside, uh, what you see. And um, as Mark described, the, the gameplay is that you are um, inside of this kind of, like a, almost like a sleeping bag or a shell, um, and you don't have any other controls with your hands or anything like that. It's all entirely controlled by your body, and your, uh, the screen has a worm that you're trying to wiggle around and pick up these sort of uh, apples and, and avoid getting hit by the other worm, and you can only do that by literally rolling around on the floor and wiggling about and, and staying confined in this, in this uh, tube. So it, it really uh, is a, the game demands that you move in a certain way that, that the interface has been uh, shaped and designed for you to, to do so. And um, uh, here, here we go. This is <laughs> the game referred to earlier, Fabulous Fabuleux, that I created uh, with Lynn Hughes, uh, Alain Thibault, and Jeffrey Jones. Um, and I wish I, I could, I didn't uh, decide to show any videos this time. There's really not too much time to, to go through everything. But uh, the idea here is that the, the, the small ball you see that the players are holding in their hands is full of sensors. It's, it's detecting pressure and um, motion and, in fact, location in the room. And the idea is then that the space of the room is something like an invisible three-dimensional uh, connect the dots game, so uh, controlled by audio cues only. So there is some, some visualization that shows you on the screen um, maybe a trailer of your movement, but in two dimensions. Meanwhile, you as a player need to move around in three dimensions following a, a sound, a bit like a, maybe a Geiger counter sound where it's uh, making a clicking sound and you're trying to find a location in, in invisible 3D space um, using the speed. If it's going tick, 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 then you know you're getting closer to that. And once you find that location, then you squeeze the ball and uh, it makes a star appear on the screen. So the idea is you're connecting these different stars um, to form a shape. And then you see here uh, one of the shapes was uh, this very, very fancy shoe, for instance. Um, I, this was a really interesting project. I really uh, wanted to create something that would, would make a kind of dance out of the, the solving of the puzzle of the game. So when, when players were moving from one location to another, that there would be something very um, watchable and performative about their movement. Uh, I have to say, though, that I think it, it did not succeed entirely on that, on that aspect, uh, because when you, when you put something in that is a very goal-driven experience, People get so focused on the goal that they don't necessarily think about the own the quality of their movement. It has to be more designed in that the that it would be necessary for them to move slowly and and or um, or uh, poetically. Instead, it was actually much more like people uh, like holding the thing and like walking very awkwardly and then you know moving it and trying to trying to find the spot. So I. You could also, uh, if you were wanting to, you could add in your own quality of movement, but the game did not actually require that. So I don't consider it a, an entire success, but it was a very interesting experiment, and there's actually some other games that I think have done better at achieving that that I'll be able to show you in a minute. Um, so you can't really talk about these kinds of uh, social and physical and, and touch-based games without dealing somewhat in, in the erotic aspects of it. And I'd like to show you this game, Fingal, which I think is a really interesting example in that it is a, an iPad game. So it's a multi-touch iPad game that ostensibly is nothing other than two people with their hands on an iPad. But uh, the, the, as you can see from the, the uh, illustrations here of the game levels on the, on the lower left, uh, it's really quite a, a very erotic game played only with the, two, the hands of the two players. Um, so it's, it's a way to get two humans actually touching and moving together intimately, or at least very suggestively. And uh, the artists who, who made this have been uh, uh, very dedicated and successful at creating games that, that cross these different boundaries. So you'll, you'll see another example from them soon. Um, they're uh, called Game Oven, and they're, they're a Dutch company. So that's one of their, one of their best known projects. Uh, and uh, another 
pair of games that, that deal in this kind of physical, social, erotic aspect. Uh, one, uh, Propinquity, also from Lynn Hughes, this time with Bart Sim Simon and Modern Nomads from 2012. Um, this was uh, a game that, that uh, also has sensors that are placed on the body. Uh, you could place them where you wished, uh, maybe your elbows or your hip or your knees or things like that. And then you're also wearing gloves. And uh, in this, the thing that's different about this uh, and makes it quite, quite special is that while you're, the, the gloves and the body sensors are aware of each other, the goal is actually to come as close as possible to the other area of the, 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 the area of the other player's body, but without actually coming into physical contact. So the closer you could get, the, the better your score would be. But if you accidentally or intentionally touch that, that sensor, then that would, uh, that would lose that, that score for you. And there were two different modes of this game that, that uh, did uh, that really drew out the way that the game design can, can shape the, the, the physical action and the quality of movement. There was one, uh, the one that we see here, which was more, uh, felt like a martial arts type of game and was, was more competitive where your goal was to uh, you touch or come close to as many of the, the sensors on the other player's body without having them come close to your own. So it was, it was more... Um, uh, competitive in that way. And then there was another mode that ended up being much more looking like a dance because it was co cooperative and you combined your score and, were, and would get a score that's better if, if you were uh, hovering near the, the uh, contact point on another person while they were also near one on you, and, but changing them so it wasn't always just standing there. It was very like, fluid and dynamic. But it was really interesting to see how just this change in the, in the game rules then changed the, the, the quality of the, the motion of the players. Oh, and then the other game is uh, the second one by Game Oven that I wanted to show you called Bounden. And it's maybe a little hard in this image to tell what's going on, but, but each uh, pair of players is holding an iPhone in one of their hands, but together. So between the hand that's meeting each other, there is an iPhone, and you must keep your, your hand on the, the screen for, it, for the game to be functioning. And then what the game looks a bit like is the small inset there at the top. It's something like a, an orb in the center that has these symbols around the outside that are appearing and disappearing as you play. And you quickly learn that the way you can sort of collect these, uh, these points or these uh, symbols is by rotating the, the iPhone together. But you have to do it in certain ways where you realize you start to be lifting it over your head together and turning over and then you have to go around and, it, and so it forms this kind of continual line that then causes you to do very um, intentionally dance-like movements and in fact they co-designed this game with the Dutch National Ballet so the input that, that was used to create these patterns of flow were created by, by choreographers. So um, yeah, what are some of the other things that, that games have not really done, really hardly at all, but I find in intensely fascinating is this uh, aspect of taste and smell. Um, I, understandably, they're, they're very difficult uh, senses to work with. They're based in chemicals. Um, but I've been doing some, some uh, experiments with, with different collaborators over the past couple of years. And I wanted to show you, show you two of these. The, the one on the left is uh, The Smell of Defeat by Alexandre Lejeune. And this is essentially a very simple game of rock, paper, scissors, but um, in, that you're playing against the machine. So it's quite a random type thing. But you have to hold your face very close to this, this device that's in front of it, um, which will, if you are successful, if you win against the, the machine, you will get a, a squirt of vodka that will go directly into your mouth. <laughs> So it's very rewarding. And um, if you, <laughs> however, if you fail, it's a risky, risky venture because if you fail, um, the, uh, the, the, the thing sitting next to that is uh, an air, aerosol air freshener, which isn't deadly by any means, but it's just really not pleasant to have this smell of clean laundry um, that's really quite close to your face. And, and it's a little bit like a skunk in its, its behavior. It just goes, you know, right, on, right onto you. So, um, I think uh, one thing that this, this game, although extremely simplistic, is really 
um, drawing on is the role that, that taste and smell play in our, in our uh, systems of reward and punishment, that, that we like to taste things that are good and we give children candy as rewards and, and, and we associate uh, delicious food with, with happiness, whereas um, the, having some kind of skunk-like behavior or bad smell um, is, is more of a, of a punishment that we dole out. Um, so this other piece, uh, Death With Death With 3000, um, was a, a project created by uh, some students of mine at Concordia University for uh, my Playing with the Senses class this year. Um, I think this takes uh, the, the use of smell one step further. Um, the, the game is a four-player game where uh, you are fighting a zombie apocalypse, but you each have a specialized role to play. You're either a medic or you're a soldier, and one of the very special roles is the sniffer. And if you are the sniffer, in, uh, in the image at the top, I, I'm the sniffer in that, that version, and this uh, white box that's sitting next to me is this one you see here on the, in the other um, image. It's a, a custom-made smell delivery system that uh, ho hooks in with Arduino to the, the game system and um, will deliver smells on demand. And, and the reason why you need that is because you're, uh, if you're the sniffer, your job is to, um, when you encounter a, a human being in the game, you need to determine whether they are um, healthy or uh, infected with this virus that will create zombies. Um, or if they're infected and too far gone to survive. Um, if they're actually a zombie by then, you, you already can tell by their, the look of them, but, but the ones before they become zombies are all looking the same, and you can only tell if they're healthy and, and rescuable or not by, by smelling them. So uh, when you encounter one of these uh, characters in the game, the game pauses for a second, uh, the fans start blowing in the device, and it blows out a, a smell, and in like a split second, you, the sniffer, have to decide which, one, which category of a, a victim that is, and then, based on that, coordinate your team to react appropriately. If it's a healthy human, then you need to send the medic to go and inoculate them so they won't get the zombie virus. And, but if it's a, um, someone who's too far gone and is, is bound to be a zombie anyway, then you have to send the soldier in to eliminate them. So it's uh, working more there with the... the, the um, the role of smell in our sensory and biological systems for detecting danger and or or safety, for instance, like if we smell smoke, of course we associate that with danger. Or if we um, smell something rotten, then we know that we shouldn't eat it, and it's it's uh, using that to its full advantage. Um, so it would be. Uh, remiss of me not to at least have something that, that's dealing in, in the, the virtual reality uh, area. But I think the, the interesting thing about this, uh, how these games that I've selected work, is that they are, are using this, this platform, this VR, as a way to not kind of hide our real reality, but in some ways uh, um, draw attention to it by, by the fact that the, the game um, takes that away from you but it then heightens your awareness of the lack of these other senses. Um, for instance, the, this one here on the left is called Please Don't Space Dog. It's from a group called Co-op Mode from just earlier this year. And um, you can see that um, on, the, on the left that the player is actually not permitted to touch the, the keyboard of the computer itself. They have uh, instead a controller that's a MIDI, MIDI controller that's uh, created for generally controlling um, music or other kinds of, of um, other devices. But here it's been used as a controller that's like the console of your spaceship that you're, that you're riding in with this uh, dog who you're trying to teach how to be a pilot. Um, but of course the dog doesn't really know how to fly the, the spaceship and it's all going crazy every once in a while and you have to be like the, the backseat driver trying to get the, the spaceship back on track um, by pushing different sequences of the buttons that you see in the, um, in the game screen itself here on the right with the, the Greek symbols on it and then some dials that you have to turn to like certain settings and the game will tell you which one you need to do. But the interesting thing of course is that when you're playing a game and you have these head mounted uh, sets on, you can't actually see the controller. Like if you haven't, if someone doesn't put it in your hands, sometimes you don't even know like where it is. 
Um, and they've taken advantage of that because you can't, in the game, see your hands either. But having this controller that has very clear um, buttons that, that uh, are in specific relation to one another, um, when you're playing it, you feel like you're fumbling and you don't know what you're doing either. So you're kind of on par with the dog. It's like the dog can't, can't fly it, but almost neither can you. And, and you're just trying to like feel around, where's the, the button that I need to see that I can push? And, and so you get this, this real disorientation based on this fact that they're asking you to use a, a controller that you can't actually ever look at with your eyes. Um, and then another uh, variation on that is Sound Self from Robin Arnott, which I also believe is in the exhibition. Um, and in this particular experience, the, the, uh, again, you're wearing the headset and you can't really um, see anything outside of that but your control of the game doesn't need you to be able to see because it's actually using your voice and you're chanting into the, a microphone and using uh, your voice, you're actually able to change the aspects of the world and uh, sort of build your own reality. Or maybe you notice that a certain note that you're singing causes a certain uh, thing to happen. You can emphasize on that or uh, you can change it and see how, how, that, does, uh, how that affects the, the visualization. So you can have an experience of that here tonight if you'd like. Um, last one I'd like to talk about is this game uh, or experience, and I'm using the term game actually, I know, quite loosely, um, but um, there isn't really a, a standard definition anymore, I think, of what game must be, and I really am happy for that because it really opens up the possibility of, of what we can experience with these. So in, in uh, for example, Gender Swap from Be Another Lab, um, the, the game it requires two players to both put on the virtual reality helmet and it also has a camera that's pointed toward the other person. There's a couple of different versions of this. In this one we see here, the two players are directly facing each other. In another version, they face a mirror um, and, and have to look at the mirror, get the, the image that's showing the other person in the mirror. Um, uh, but the, the idea, uh, how the play proceeds is that the two players have to in a sense, mirror what one another do, um, but entirely by watching themselves through the other person's eyes and, and as if they were in the body of the other person. And then like, if they're sitting there and one person starts to raise their arm, the other person must raise the arm in a kind of mirror image way. And so um, the game is not only about this um, changing the embodiment, and, and in fact, because of the way they've designed it, it's meant to be played by two people of uh, different genders. Um, it's not really like an escapist kind of fantasy. It's more about re-embodiment and, and resituating re us physically by, by giving us this, this um, whoa, this um, swindle, this uh, vertigo, really. Um, and the, the creators of the game are um, still in development of it, and the, the way they see it is as an investigation on both not only gender identity and, and queer theory, but also this intimacy, because you're, in many cases, you're not wearing much clothing, and in mutual respect, because uh, you are moving together with each other, it, uh, it never is supposed to be that one person is just like doing the thing that they want to do and the other person has to follow. It really has to be like very slowly you are, you're trying to understand and predict what the other person is doing and moving along with that. And um, the other um, kind of area of research they consider this to, to fall into is feminist technoscience. So, um, so in conclusion, uh, some of the, the things that I think these, these more embodied art games, game art, um, are making uh, possible or at least making very um, attractive and inter interesting is uh, that they are ideal for developing games that put us uh, as humans in contact with each other, um, not just with a game and a controller, but with other human beings. And they are... Um, addressing our, our movement within and our connection to the physical world, perhaps uh, in our bodies or in, a, in a sp the space of a, of a room. They're uh, embracing and addressing human physicality and, and human uniqueness. 
uh, and the diversity of, of experience and, and of human ability. And especially they are helping, I think, to uh, re-engage and, and develop, further develop our uh, perception of these neglected senses that we've, that we've mostly abandoned in games uh, in the last few decades. So thank you. my water glass. Here's some water. Mm -hmm. you, you have one? Do yeah, I have sound? I sound? do. All right. Thank you. And ask you to join me up front. Um, <clears throat> I'll just look around the room and offer you, uh, the audience the ability to ask the first questions. I um, obviously have a lot of questions and I have a lot to say. Okay. Well, actually, I always have questions, but I, I, I really um, uh, was very intrigued by what you were presenting. But um, if anyone wants to go first, please do. I, I offer you the possibility, if you don't want to phrase your questions in English, I will do spontaneous translations. So, so please just um, feel free to participate. But um, I'll just warm things up here um, with, with some... Oh, yes, please. Okay. Do you, I'll give you my microphone if I don't have one here. Yep. I'll give you mine. That's cool. Yes, Heather, thank you very much. I was um, very intrigued by some of the examples, all of which are totally new to me. But I... I did recognize some of the strategies there, and I thought especially interesting from my point of view in light of what I was saying earlier about disorientation and reorientation, how important that is to uh, um, challenge or redirect uh, one's sense of the, you know, one's own body in space and body in relation to others. But I also thought that some of these uh, games, well, first of all, I thought maybe one needs to, I mean, most of your the games, the examples you showed, were what one would call social games rather than competitive games and agonistic games. So I wonder whether it's important to make those distinctions in relation to what your main focus is, namely on bodily interaction. But what also struck me is that in the examples that you gave, I recognized some of the, the, the games we played as children. Well, me in the 50s, again, bringing in the 50s. Um, you, you mentioned one, which is uh, Schere, Stein, Papier, Scissors, uh, Paper, Stone. That's an extremely well-known one. Uh, blind Man's Buff and so on. In other words, l some of those seem to draw on very traditional games, and I wonder what you had to say about that. On the other hand, others, especially the, the last one you showed, is very reminiscent of video installations from the 70s, mm -hmm. Dan Graham in particular. So I wonder how you would position your examples within those different histories. Mm -hmm. um, speaking specifically to the, the sort of playground or child, childhood games, that, that is definitely a, a huge influence that, that really kind of started uh, around 20... Well, it's, it's, there's an there's a, a t entire field, I guess, of, of new street games that actually are not technologically mediated necessarily. They're, they're using more social mediation, but taking those different dynamics from, from old school street games and kind of updating them or giving them different narratives or just reintroducing them, in fact, to people that may not have actually experienced them the first time. Um, and uh, within the field of game design, those kind of games are, are heavily referenced, especially in this, this field of these um, mixed uh, um, digitally enhanced, if you could say, or digitally, digitally altered um, um, games. In fact, the, the very first one, the JS Joust, is very well known in its non-digital form now, um, but because of because of JS Joust, it's uh, like lemons and spoons. I, I don't know if it has a special name, but you essentially play the same thing. But you balance a lemon on a wooden spoon, and you try to jostle that off of, of someone. I've even seen mixed sessions of people playing JS Joust plus the lemon and spoon game in the same physical space. Um, so there, there is a growing re uh, like awareness and rediscovery of these of these kinds of, of games and their their influence. I think maybe um, I'm the, uh, most of them actually are a little more aggressive, and I probably most of those street games are. And and I don't know if the the ones that use more digital technology are less aggressive uh, because of the fragility of the technology or possibly. Um, 
I'm less interested in those because I discovered pretty early on when this, this whole uh, street game revival came about that many of them were based on the abilities that one has as a child of, of running and making quick motion and uh, like, you know, I'm 45 and I have a bum knee, so I'm not really playing those games much either. And, and I think to me, I'm drawn more to the ones that, that uh, are doing something different with the quality of the movement. And so the, those are just in particular the ones I'm also attracted to, not, not only uh, you know, the, the reason of them being the, more, the ones with more uh, digital influence. As for your other question, I think it's just part of the uh, continual rediscovery of the same um, sort of philosophical, theoretical underpinnings. I'm not sure whether the, the uh, groups that are working in, in these, these different specific instances are familiar with the work. I don't know. You guys, was that a hand raising? No, OK. Um, I'll just actually jump into that line of inquiry. Um, because I, I find it fascinating myself to make these bridges between what you're showing, you've showed us in the last half an hour um, with regards to using digital technologies for these um, different forms of play and um, older forms of play. You know, the, the term came to mind uh, uh, body play, which was coined by, you know, the great uh, body modification pioneer mm -hmm. Fakir Musafa out in San Francisco to. Um, uh, characterize what he was doing with himself with you know sensory deprivation mm -hmm. or you know um, actually uh, sensory expansion also through through pain experiments and, and then what's going on within king culture at their play parties you know people just experimenting with what is possible within this you know um, bodily form that we are given and obviously you know we use our different media whether it's you know movies or whether it's you know digital games to to just play with those possibilities and so you you were saying that the, the whole term game uh, it has become sort of so loose that it doesn't really apply. Maybe, you know, we should really be talking about play forms, um, and especially like with something like Sound Self, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a play form that doesn't have a goal. It doesn't have a winning condition. It's, it's really more about just experimenting with a very, very unusual aesthetic setup, and that's what I see a lot of these pieces doing. Yeah, and that's true of a lot of the, the, not maybe so many of the pieces I showed, but some of the pieces I showed, and definitely some of the more interesting work, like the, uh, especially now that, that the um, Oculus is starting to, have, people are creating content for that that isn't specifically a game, like the, the one that you mentioned with the, the guillotine, uh, that which I thought was hilarious, I had fun. <laughs> I know some people are very uh, uh, opposed to that particular um, piece, but. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think that it's necessary. I mean, there are, if you want to very strictly define games, there are many no different strict definitions, but within the, the field that we're talking about of expressive, digital, playful media, it's not necessary to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Um, just some thoughts, because um, I was struck by um, the way your examples um, um, some of them try to get rid of the uh, the screen, or more to have you more you know interaction without a screen, and that reminded me of uh, um, the trend in, in, in mainstream uh, game designing to get rid of the controller. Mm -hmm. First, the Wii, so the, the children can move, physically fit, uh, ready to take jobs, physically fitness, mm -hmm. and all this stuff, and uh, later on the the Kinect, which is saying you are the controller, which is not true, but I should be, and and um, if, if you think about these, these three uh, theories of remediation, that, that everything is to be, uh, uh, to have more immediacy, to get rid of all the medium, to get the real stuff mediated, but without the medium, sort of. And in, in your example, some of them shows that uh, it's not about uh, immediacy, but about hypermediacy to really show the interfaces, to show the differences of reacting and interacting, and to get, to get a warm by doing this could be easier. So it's not about you know, getting the warm, but to, to know how to play and how to be, be played. So is, is there a trend in you know, making it more difficult and not to make it more easy or more, you know, if you, if you, if you think about playfulness in forms of it, it should be easy, no? and, and, or if you, if you do so. Well, I'm not sure that's true. I mean, in many cases, you could argue that to make it playful, you need to have a challenge. Yes. So uh, 
Um, but interesting point about the taking away of the, the screens, I think um, perhaps there, in the examples I was showing, they all had some kind of feedback, some kind of the digital aspect was used for feedback. It just ne wasn't necessarily in a two-dimensional display on a flat surface in front of the, the player. Sometimes it was in a two-dimensional display in two eyes right here, right? Um, or in an object that you're holding or something on a body. Um, so I think the, the culture is getting a little more developed about what interface can be and what kind of feedback we can understand and perceive when it's in this context of a, of a rule set and it means something like the color of the, the bulb at the end of the, the PlayStation controller in JS Joust or the um, sound effect in Perpinquity when you get close to someone's uh, sensor but haven't touched it so you know you're successful or just using these other modalities to, to, to do that instead of with the screen. I actually also, I, I tried to think a, a lot about how um, I didn't talk about all these things like Connect and, and we and, and these other things and like what's different about what I showed compared to those because they're out there and they're, they're quite mainstream and um, came to the conclusion that um, it was something to do with that lack of the screen. It's not just that you are now the controller and you're trying to do something on the screen. It's more about bringing the, these interfaces into uh, the social or more, um, the more touch-based physical world instead of just using it as an abstracted way to make something happen on, on a, in a digital universe. Ich bin ein bisschen müde, deswegen bitte ich dich zu übersetzen, Marc, ins Englische. Es hat natürlich immer Spiele gegeben, aber es gab die Kinderspiele und es gab die Spiele der Erwachsenen. Die Kinderspiele waren Straßenspiele und die Spiele der Erwachsenen waren Kartenspiele und ich weiß nicht was alles. Und es ist mir hier aufgefallen, dass es lauter junge Erwachsene waren. Und gleichzeitig haben wir gehört, die Vorbilder für diese Spiele waren Straßenspiele. Ähm, so, ich habe einfach den Verdacht dass diese Straßenspiele aus äh, Regionen, ich will nicht sagen der dritten Welt stammen, aber doch aus Regionen, in denen Kinder wirklich noch auf der Straße spielen können, was sie ja bei uns überhaupt gar nicht mehr können. Und dass auf diese Weise mit unseren Kindern, die behütet von einem Ort zum anderen gefahren werden, meistens in großen Limousinen, dass denen auf diese Weise, wenn sie junge Erwachsene sind, Erfahrungen vermittelt werden können, die sie als Kinder schon überhaupt gar nicht mehr gemacht haben. <laughs> My translator. Okay. For, uh, um, sorry, yeah, she asked me in the beginning since she's tired um, to translate. So I'll try and sum this up. Um, the, um, Yuta was saying that there have always been uh, games of children and games of um, adults. And um, that her, and what we saw in your examples were mo mostly young adults. And her suspicion is that, uh, or her impression or idea was that, um, that many of the street games that are now being recreated in this digital sphere originated uh, on the street in maybe um, third world countries that our children aren't even exposed to anymore, um, being you know uh, in this very protected environments, driven around from one place to the next, and so that these missing experiences are now being recreated in the digital sphere. If I, I think I got the gist of it, mm -hmm. the, the, and, and that was her question: if if you would agree or not. I, I don't think I would agree. Um, I, I agree that these, many of the games are perhaps rediscoveries or reimagining of these kind of core play concepts that are also used in, in locations where people don't have the, the, the technology. That, that's um, definitely the case. But most of these, I think uh, the young people are, I mean, it is quite a phenomenon now of, of uh, children really not being permitted to leave their, their homes and being expected to stay in and stay safe because it's so dangerous out there and a lot of, of uh, I think, reasonable laments about, about that situation. But most of the people who are developing these are definitely at least at university age or are older. And maybe their reaction to the fact that they they didn't have this opportunity. But I think most of them are so physical that you kind of have to play them outdoors. You can't really play most of them 
in too confined of an environment. You either need, if it's indoors, you need a very large space. Um, and some of them are designed to be able to be taken outdoors. They can run uh, on a laptop or they can run you know, with other uh, smaller uh, Arduinos or other kinds of technology. So I'm not sure it's a direct result of that kind of confinement uh, to this movement, but it's an interesting relationship that they have to one another. Yeah, um, well, I'm, I'm faster, so I'll just jump back and forth. <laughs> yes, um, Heather, pretend I'm somebody else now uh, asking another question, because it's a little more aggressive, transgressive. Um, you, you were pointing out that these games are, you know, social games or even erotic games, but um, when you showed, uh, when you explained uh, the smell of defeat or death with, I was getting a little bit uncomfortable because there you're talking about rewards and punishments and suddenly I realized that uh, there's a way in which those players are actually lab rats for... Uh, both physiological experiments and social experiments. Mm -hmm. So um, can you um, mm -hmm. respond to that? <laughs> um, I would say that the smell of defeat is definitely uh, transgressive in that way and uh, kind of uh, unapologetically so. I think it's, it's uh, done with a kind of mad cackle uh, from the designer. and. Uh, he put himself through everything that he would, I mean, I think the person who experienced the most torment from that game was the designer himself. Uh, but uh, I think uh, in the case of, of uh, the death whiff, um, the interesting thing that I found in that regard is that the uh, team spent a lot of time actually designing what those smells would be. I didn't mention that in the talk, like how do you distinguish between the smell of an almost uh, infected or recently infected versus uh, you know helpless person um, and they they had some smells that they themselves found to be just simply too nauseating and uh, in the end they decided to to scale back that nausea factor a little bit to make it so that it is an actual entertainment experience or pleasurable experience, you know, maybe a little bit disturbing, but, but not uh, so punishing. And I think in the end, the, the smell of the, uh, the smell of the, the, the human who is well is a kind of medicinal, um, uh, like uh, Vicks vapor rub sort of smell. And then the, uh, I guess, Tiger Bomb. I don't know what the equivalent would be in Germany. Um, yeah. Tiger Bomb? Tiger Bomb. Yeah, yeah, OK. And uh, then I can't remember what the middle one was, but the infected zombie was something like a very uh, just dirt, sort of rooty, earthy kind of smell um, to kind of um, make that association to, to their eventual decay, but without being putrid. So um, I think that that was their their solution to that. Um, yeah, is that answer? But, but, you know, just, just, sorry. just think of think of how bad it could be. Ebola victims, and then think of the social implications uh -huh. of applying those routines of what you do with uh, you know zombies with Ebola patients, and you realize you know hmm. what a, well, but, but, well, actually, you do get problematic social scenarios if you apply many games to real-world situations. That's why they're games. I'm sorry. I, no, <laughs> um, I, I have another question, actually. Um, I, I really, you know, was in, very intrigued by your examples, and I think they were very good examples for the topic of your talk when you're talking about embodiment in games. But the question I wanted to ask, because I think I've thought about this topic quite a bit myself, is um, couldn't one also, you know, uh, say that there's always a form of embodiment going on, even with, you know, the typical games where you're holding the PlayStation controller or any kind of game pad or even keyboard and mouse and controlling an avatar on screen and the way that avatar is programmed, you know, whether it can walk or it can crawl or, you know, in a game like Deus Ex Human Revolution where you're constantly getting these cyborg enhancements that let you jump very far or, you know, see through walls or, or change your motility and your sensory perception in the game are also, you know, dealing exactly with this dimension of embodiment that we're, you that could, we're talking about. You could, of course, uh, when players play, they often become so physically engaged in the game. You know, that's that's why they, they like lean forward or they like jerk if they're driving. You know, they they 
we can't help but be come physically invested in the game. But I think for me, those just aren't as interesting because they aren't designed to bring out some kind of new or different uh, behavior that the, the ones I was showing, that, that that's more interesting for me is, is that they're actually thinking about how will the player move, how will this make the, the player uh, respond physically and try to draw out different uh, interesting behaviors. Anyone? We still have a bit of time. I have another question, but um, i give you the opportunity to um, uh, talk to Heather. Otherwise, I would li also like to touch on one last aspect, namely the, the aspect of touch. And you said something about, you know, there, there's always or very often these erotic aspects in, in these games. And I, I don't know if you would say for all the games you were showing, but especially maybe the ones where you're dealing with a kind of uh, haptic sensation where you're dealing with with touch and then maybe you know think about our whole relationship to to touch screens and how, how that has really changed our relationship to the digital in right. in general because that's always you know that's the only sensory modality where we're you know feeling the other and ourselves at the same time and this is a very special you know sensoric situation in and of itself yeah. well, I, that was why Fingal was so interesting for me because I mean the touch it's a touch screen it's meant to be touched but it's always this, uh, even if you show a kind of surface, and there's also uh, different ways that people are trying to emulate different senses of, of like texture and things using uh, electric signals that, that your fingertip can sense and things, but they're always just a little weird. And, and the fact that they use this, this very slick, absolutely um, perfectly smooth surface, but made the touch be but with another human being and, and the transgression of that, um, was what made that particular uh, case, I think, very successful in, in dealing with, with touch. And then maybe the, the other one that is, is similar. It's also about touch between the, the humans, human bodies uh, is the, the last one I showed because sometimes it's about touching yourself, but seeing in your head, you see the other person touching them. So it's, it's this kind of connection of the, of the, the physical to the self-perception and... Yeah, I guess I didn't really, there hasn't been too much done with, with a touch of surfaces other than, than a human, other human contact, but could be an interesting realm of, of exploration. There's so much you could do with things um, like the um, conductive ink and things like that where you actually could put a surface that would be able to, to sense your, your interaction with it. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are things like that and needs further research. So actually, this is a nice note to end on that, you know, as I think you succeeded in showing that one of the most interesting fields of research and development at the moment is this whole field of interface design, which, which all these games are, are intricately linked to. Um, they, they all use customized interfaces. That's why they don't work as mass market products. They're not using standard interfaces. And, um, you know, whereas maybe 20, 30 years ago, we might have thought, you know, the, the mouse and the keyboard was the end of all things. Right now, we're just witnessing an explosion of interfaces, not only for gaming and playing, but, but for interacting with the digital per se. And I think we're going to be hearing more about that in the coming um, in day and uh, in our last presentation, which is uh, we're going to just uh, continue over into, uh, I think we have a, a quick technical switch over and Jan, you will be introducing Wendy Chan. So I would just uh, please encourage you to, to stay seated and um, then uh, uh, um, listen to our last guest for the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Heather. Thank you. Thank you.